You're listening to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Find us on the web at jsparty.fm, on the Fediverse at JS Party, at changelog.social, and of course, wherever you get your podcasts, just search for JS Party, you'll find us. Thanks to our partners at Fly. Launch your app near your users for peak performance. Fly makes it easy. Learn more at fly.io. Okay, hey, it's party time, y'all. Party animals. I'm Jared, your internet friend, here with an emergency pod that's not even really an emergency, but Nick declared it a state of emergency <laughs> in order to continuously troll me. Nick, welcome to this emergency podcast. Ahoy, ahoy. Hi, Jared. How you doing, man? Fantastic. Today. You look happy. You look excited. There's like TS emoji flying in our JS Party channel in Slack. So, I feel like something's going on in the TS world. I'm not sure what that means, what it stands for, but K-Ball is also here. What's up, K-Ball? Hey, I'm excited to have a, a tech emergency and not all the like drama life emergency stuff that's been going on in the world the last couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, it's been exciting times here in these United States, probably all around the world. And have you crowd struck? I did not get crowd struck. Nick, did you? I was on vacation. I, I was on a boat and I didn't know that anything happened. Did the boat reboot? Nope. Nice. Very, very nice. Well, uh, we are not here to talk global IT outages, although we certainly could. We're here to talk about Node.js because this is JS Party and we're talking news. And Node team's been making some moves, man. I mean, they've been doing stuff. And so we're here for it. And Nick is here for this first one, which is that they've added an experimental feature to strip TypeScript from the face of the earth. Oh no, to strip TypeScript types from the code it runs. Honestly, I don't even know what that means. I'm not sure why everybody's freaking out in the channel and saying we have to record a podcast about this. So Nick, please illuminate. Yeah. So when you write TypeScript, fun fact, it's not really runnable because there's no runtime that actually runs it. So any runtime that does converts it to JavaScript, which effectively just removes the types and then executes it. So the types are just there for your your pleasure as you're developing, but we use a bunch of third-party tools, and now we get to use less third-party tools because Node can just do it natively. And that's what this flag does, which is dash dash experimental strip types. That will just strip the types, exactly what it says. It sounds exciting, but like we've been able to do this for a long time with either like other tools, you know, just running it through Vite, for example, or or something else, or just using like a custom loader, like tsimp, is effectively like the same. You just pass it a flag. Tsimp. Yeah, I heard about that on your podcast with Josh Goldberg. Now you don't need a build step, though. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now I'm getting excited. K ball. See, K ball knows how to speak my language. Nick, you do not. You only <laughs> speak the language of TypeScript and other various Vim things. I was just listening to your Adam Lissigor podcast. And I don't think that you exclaimed what your love language is. So is it no build step? Is that your <laughs> love language? Uh, my love language, turns out, is English. It's my favorite. It's my best. It's my first, my last, and my everything. But I'm here for no build step. I don't, I also here for stripping TypeScript out of things. <laughs> but if this is already, already available in a bunch of stuff, like people are genuinely excited about it is it just because like it's more official it's more proper it's less third party and becoming more first party is that the what the assignment's all about yeah i think that anytime that there's movement from the tool itself into this like it it's going to th this is a, an experimental flag for now we'll see what it actually like culminates into but i think that this is probably you probably trace this feature back to uh just competition working, like having other runtimes like Dino, like Bun, that more natively support TypeScript. They don't want to be left as the only ones. And TypeScript has pretty much won, so it should be supported in this way. The browser has plans, potentially, uh, with the the type, what is it, type annotations? Type annotations. Yeah. So 
it's getting it's getting there. Mm-hmm. K ball additions, subtractions, multiplications. I mean, I was just admiring that masterful trolling by Nick of TypeScript is basically <laughs> one. Uh, but I did not engage with that sentence. I moved on. I know that's why I brought it back for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> no, I mean, I honestly, I'm team build step. Right. I mean, we know this from you previous are. pods. I I think. I'm more in favor of doing interesting things with the build than vanilla stripping TypeScript types out with the build. But like, if you're building already, like, does it really matter? So, right. Not sure this is quite the the emergency level that I would have <laughs> flagged. But you know, once again, where's your sense of excitement? <laughs> See, we have to have reasons for people to tune in, K Ball. <laughs> but J- Jared, actually, um, I have I have a way forward for you to do TypeScript and not worry about TypeScript so much, which is okay. LLM based coding tools are the future, oh. <laughs> and you don't have to deal with TypeScript. You just tell the machine learning model write this in TypeScript, and then you're done. Uh, I could be convinced of that, perhaps. If I didn't have to touch any of the artifacts either, like if we got far enough away that I don't even effectively have to know that it's TypeScript, but it just works, then, and that's a big if, if it just works, then yeah, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I'm happy to move higher up the value chain at all times. I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're getting there. Here's an experimental flag that I would like. Dash, dash, experimental strip bugs. Would you guys be here for that, strip bugs? <laughs> It's just called TypeScript. I mean, why can't just, we have why can't we have nice things? You know, like strip bugs, even better. If you just write write it and express what you're trying to do, you'll write less bugs. Kyle in the chat says a dash dash fix semicolons. That would that, I think we kind of have that at this point, don't we? Uh, sort of, kind of, sort of, pretty much. Nick, let me ask you a serious question, personal question, real question. Have you been working this week? I have. You've been writing code. I have. I won't tell you what kind of code I've been writing, but I've been. Have you been writing code. TypeScript? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> this wait, 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 wait. my line of questioning. Hold what on, have you been hold writing? On, hold on. Let me guess. <laughs> have you been writing PHP again? Yes, actually. Via a comment <laughs> form on your website. <laughs> okay, so that that ruins my line of questioning. Well, how about last week? Did you write some TypeScript last week? I'm trying to really bring this home. <sighs> no. <laughs> All right, let's move on. I, I don't I probably write less TypeScript than even you, Jared, now. Really? Because I'm <laughs> I'm batting zero over here. <laughs> Me too. Okay. So we're just merely playing the parts now at this point. K ball, we're shadows of our old selves. Although I'm not. I'm representing exactly my side. I do not write <laughs> TypeScript and I don't write TypeScript. So I guess Nick, you're the I still like TypeScript. I would rather be writing TypeScript. But Oh, you should get one of those bumper stickers that says that, you know. Like that, I'd rather be fishing bumper sticker or something. <laughs> yes. I'd rather be typescripting. That'd be a good laptop sticker. How about SQLite? Do you guys like SQLite or SQLite? Absolutely. Yeah. Underrated. This one's cool. So they've also been working on another experimental flag. This has been merged. It's out there on the nightlies, but not released yet in Node. Built-in SQLite module. So... Batteries included, like database right there. Bam. Do they bundle SQLite or this is just the interface? That I do not know. Let me see if I can get that answer quickly via a quick look at the actual files changed. Ben GL in the chat is saying that it is bundled. That's even faster. That is super cool. Yeah. If they're bundling it because that really then lowers the barrier to writing simple, you know, persistence related relational code. And, you know, unlike the uh, build step, no build step, we're all doing a build step anyway. This is talking about like deployment heck, right? Do I have to deal with figuring out like where I'm deploying it to? Do I have to install SQLite on my Mac and not have it break? I don't know. I mean, actually, SQLite's pretty simple regardless because it's just a binary. But It's simple and it's pre-installed in almost every operating system in the world, but still. So never mind. I'm not sure where <laughs> this gets us, except you can not have to do that step. Sure. And it also is the API as well, right? So you do not have to go out and grab whatever the node SQLite library, whatever, whatever. So there's a bigger actual question here, which is sort of philosophical around the extent to like what should live in a core versus what should be actual 
libraries. That's kind of what I was thinking as well. Yeah, good point. Like we're going into this. Boundaries. You're defining boundaries, K-Ball. Remember, I want you to do an episode on this. I do. Yes. Well, and (laughs) I think, you know, there, there's, it's an art more than a science. Mm -hmm. JavaScript land has historically defined lots of many small modules, which is way on the end of one spectrum where you're saying essentially like there's no standard library or there's a minimal standard library. Everything is your choice. Everything you have to configure. That's a lot of cognitive load. On the flip side, you put everything in there in the the core, like it slows things down. It's hard to innovate. If they get it wrong, like it's a mess. And like if I'm using this, I can't necessarily just say, okay, I've been prototyping with SQLite. Now I'm going to swap in Postgres and it all works fine because I have an abstraction between my database and the type of, you know, and the data manipulation or whatever I'm doing. Instead, now I got to rip out SQLite and do other different things with it. I mean, you could code that way anyways, if you were forward looking. You could. How many times have you ripped the database out though? Honestly, of an app, either mid dev or mid prod. <laughs> <laughs> Mid flight. It's actually not not that uncommon to like use SQLite for development and then just swap into something like Postgres or something like that for I think that's cool when you're cowboy coding. I think that over time that bites you in, in ways. I've definitely been bit. Even just going Well, no, totally. I mean, once you actually yeah. get to the point where you're deploying, you're gonna swap your local to be Postgres too, so that you're not Yeah, you wanna be as close to as possible to production as you can, I think. But when you're rapid prototyping your first initial stuff, you might do it in SQLite because it's super simple. You don't have to deploy a database or deal with all of that. So that's gotten easier too. Right. Um, and then at some point you want to swap it out. Well, there are people now that are really putting SQLite into production in ways that used to be frowned upon. And there's certainly places uh, as a warning, there are places where SQLite will not do well in production. Write heavy web applications. I just don't think that that's a place for that. But there's lots of places where it can do just fine, especially at small scales, which most of our websites slash businesses are. And so people are really starting to take this seriously and maybe never swap it out. Maybe that's just your production database too. Who knows? Depends on the use case. I think this is good for Node though. I, I do think it's difficult to define the boundaries. And I saw this and I thought, great idea. Executed well, looks good, ship it. I mean... Node is better with a built-in embedded database in there, for sure. To your point, right, a lot of the uses for using it in production are you're shipping like Electron apps or you're shipping little desktop apps or things like that. And if I don't have to worry about bundling it myself because Node already does that for me, that is one headache removed. Yeah, one of the people in the comments of the PR for this actually made that exact point that they really struggle with their Electron app because the SQLite adapter with Electron, the third-party thing, is flaky and it disconnects a lot and blah, blah, blah. And having this built into Node just makes their life easier. So I think that's a very good point. JavaScript. It's not just for the web anymore. Node times 5,000. They keep saying that. <laughs> is this comparable to, like, I know that Dino shipped a, a key value store as part of their their core. Mm-hmm. Would this be like a, a comparable thing, but more open? I, I haven't used the Dino KV at all. Either have I. I know what a key value store is, so I can comment on Comparing that to SQLite, I don't know if they have like way more functionality than a typical key value store, but if they don't, and it's like, you know, pass in a key, maybe you can do some indexes if you're forward looking, but not real relational tables and acid and blah, 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 blah. It's just like key value, key value. If that's what Mm -hmm. Dino's deal is, this is dramatically more functional as a data store. They're also not trying to charge you for it. Yeah. (laughs) Fair. That's just like the comparison that that came to my mind, like with inspiration for this potentially, like, I I don't know where it came from or anything, but that's right with with like the TypeScript thing in the previous segment, you know, Dino and button both support that just, I'm I'm probably drawing correlations where they don't exist. Mm. You think nodes playing catch up on, on all fronts, perhaps. I think it's exciting to see a lot of new features coming like this. Well, no, Node is not the only one getting new features. Well, wait, I did add, a, I have a last minute add there. Oh, okay, I, I didn't see you it. saw that, Go. I wanted to call it out. My mouse just died. <laughs> you use a mouse? <sighs> well, now I use a trackpad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to sneak this into. I saw it from a tweet. I think it was uh, Matt Pocock on Twitter talking about style text. Have you seen this? What's Twitter? 
I won't call it the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't seen style text. What is this? Have you ever used chalk before or some way to create command line applications with colored text in the browser or in the, in the terminal? You threw me for a loop in the browser, but when you went back to the terminal, I was with you. <laughs> I have not, but I have seen them and I use them and they're beautiful. Well, it looks like as of node 20 dot something dot 10 that now exists it's in there. It's just built, it's just built in. Now you can just say style text and you can say style text red and then give it a, a string to, to print out and it'll print it out in red coloring. Okay. So here we go again, K ball bringing more stuff into node core things that were previously libraries, but maybe are just generally useful for anybody making command line apps. I don't know. Now with no extra dependencies, you can build a command line app that stores all of its config into an SQLite database right? and you write it in TypeScript and you have no third party dependencies. I thought you were going to say no bugs and I was going to have and to no go back bugs. over your conversation. <laughs> <laughs> And you can have one of those configurations be what color do you want the outputs to be? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. I feel like the danger, as always, is you get to a place where it's like bloated and it's too much, you know, disk or stores things down or the cognitive load of keeping it in mind is too high. These things are like opt in in a lot of ways. Like, I don't think the cognitive load piece is a huge problem. You had that one way or another. We're installing Node. I don't think it's causing any like i don't see any major problems here it is just like that's the path that things travel right we see this with software all the time they start off very slim and have core functionality and then they add more and more and they're doing this for this power user and that for that power user and at some point you have adobe products and you're like what the heck do i do with this like there's 20 million options mm -hmm. i know how to use three of them and yet I can't get rid of the rest of them up from my screen. That's not really as big of an I'll issue. I'll talk Git for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, is the, that is the trajectory. And then a competitor comes along and does a simple version again, and we'll probably see that. But yeah, it definitely feels like you know, JavaScript land, we are currently in a consolidation of you know, bringing more things into core. Yeah. And the same thing's happening in the language, uh, which maybe you wanted to move into that area. I did. But Nick snuck in some styled text on me. Oh, wait, no, I'm kidding. I, I don't have anything else. I do think it's interesting. I think it's cool. At a certain point, you just wonder how much stuff can you shove in the box, you know? But this is what happens with mature ecosystems. You know, you wouldn't want this when Chalk just first came out. It's like all of a sudden it's in Node Core because things in the core are going to move slower. They're not going to have as much iteration. I mean, this is what happens with Apple Sherlock's things, right? Like Apple has Sherlocked X. No, not the platform, but the variable X. And everyone that loved X is mad. And then they realize, oh, Apple's doing a 80% version of what this is. It's never going to actually reach parity. They don't even want to. They want to provide kind of a baseline feature set that that thing provides. And there's, there's a place in the world for it. But once it gets mature and there's not much change in, I mean, SQLite's a good example. It's like lower risk. Anyways, moving on, moving on to the language. What's new for JavaScript devs in ECMAScript 2024? This is a nice write-up from Mary Branscombe at the new stack, all about new features in JavaScript itself. Most notably to me, what's not in there? See how I'm always discontented? I'm like, here's the first thing. What's not in 24, which is temporal. Ooh. And decorators, the big ones. I want temporal. T time still continues to suck. When is that going to be in there? Right? I mean, I feel like when was it that we asked Jordan Harband when temporal was going to land? And he said, soon. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> it was long enough ago I can't remember. I think like it's feature complete, but there's just like things in the way, things that only I think... ECMAScript insiders and like those people understand. Maybe it's drama and politics. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's certain browsers not doing things. But yeah, uh, 2025 for those things. But let's not poo poo the effort that has gone in. So there is some cool stuff that's new. Promise dot with resolvers, which is uh, something that's fixing a pain point for a lot of people, which is basically having to do this small little wrapper around their promises. According to Daniel Ehrenberg, who's been on the podcast, 
I think he's an ECMA vice president. He's definitely instrumental to pushing the language forward. Um, what he says about this, he says, previously, when you created a promise, the ways that you resolve it and you give it its final state were APIs only accessible inside the function that you built it with. But with this new static method called promise.withresolvers, it gives you a way to create a promise and it gives you direct access to those resolution functions. This is going to remove a lot of boilerplate for a lot of people. Nick, you're nodding along. Is this something that's going to cause a little bit of happiness in, in your life? A little bit. Uh, I'm mostly excited because I get to to say a classic line from the early days of this podcast, which is Dojo already did that. Uh, oh, classic. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't jQuery do this as well? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's not exactly new, but it's new to the language. And when broadly available, we'll let people, you know, remove some of their little shim code, wrapper code. I can't think of the last time I had to do this, but I have had to in the past, like, create a new promise and then inside of that callback, like, assign the reject right. and resolve to variables that I declared outside of the, the callback. Yeah, exactly. You're basically doing, like, closure manipulation in order to keep things in scope and... At that point, I just turn over to the LM. I'm like, can you write this real quick? Because I've, <laughs> why is this null right here or undefined or whatever when it's not supposed to be? Oh, because you didn't do your closure correctly, blah, blah, blah. So, well, and this, this sort of topic of dealing better with asynchronicity and data loads is one of the areas that I think, like, I, so I, at a conference earlier this summer, there was a, um, roundtable conversation with Q&A that had both one of the, the folks really up in Angular and then it had uh, Ryan Carniato. So a lot of like sharp front end people. And I asked them like, what are the big unresolved problems? Like, it seems like there's a lot of consensus moving towards signals and doing these other things, but like what what is still out there? And this was a thing that was raised is like dealing with asynchronicity well is something that just like all the frameworks are sort of looking at, you have like React took a stab at this with Suspend and what are they doing there? You have the Angular has like all that complexity with the baked in, whatchamacallit, what is their observables framework that they use? Rx? Yeah, RxJS, you're right, it was Rx. So like that feels like, you know, it's that's like the big hammer in the space right now. And so this just in some ways feels like it's fitting into that queue of like, we just need better tooling for dealing with things that are asynchronous and outstanding and how do you handle them in different ways um, and being able to manipulate your resolvers as, for example, maybe a different promise resolved. And so now the promise that you had for this outstanding one, it needs to do something slightly different or other things. Like that is the tooling that we need to be able to deal with multiple layers of asynchronicity. Yep, agreed. Also new, array grouping. Array grouping. Group by, perhaps that's the name of it. What's the exact function name here? Group by, object.group by. It is group by. I thought that's what it should okay. be. So something that those of us who've been writing Ruby or other languages are pretty <laughs> familiar with. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, like normally you would pull this in with Lodash or something. I'm sure Lodash has a group by. Sometimes function names are slightly different. And super useful, needed all the time. This is basically where you have a list or an array of things and you want to split them into multiple groups based on some property about them or their ability to pass or fail a function, et cetera. And, you know, it's not groundbreaking stuff, but again, it's just like taking things that everybody needs and probably at this point still uses Lodash for and uh, throwing it right in there so you don't have to pull in that particular function. Now there is a new, you guys heard of this, there's a new competitor enters the chat, a Lodash alike. I'm looking up now. I covered it in changelog news recently and it was new to me. So maybe I'll say it's new and next will be like, I've been using this forever. ES toolkit. You guys familiar with ES toolkit? I do remember it from changelog news. Yeah. So I obviously haven't used it. You haven't used it, but this is pretty new. It's a state of the art, high performance JavaScript utility library with a small bundle size and strong type annotations. That's where Nick started really perking up when I said that. And it's cool because it has built-in tree shaking support, which means, you know, if you just need that one group by function, it's going to shake out everything else and bundles down 97% further than Lodash, according to the author. Now I haven't done any fact checking on this. We'll take, we'll take their word for it and built-in TypeScript support. So pretty cool. If you're still using Lodash, I think it's probably worth a look. It's just maybe a more, 
I won't say modern because everybody does, but I'll say a more recent addition to that particular utility library. Remember, it all started with underscore. Nick, you remember underscore JS? Oh, I sure do. I was in the backbone world once. Yeah, man. Backbone and CoffeeScript author Jeremy Ashkenes created underscore. No? Uh, I was never into CoffeeScript. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird that you hated CoffeeScript so much, but you love TypeScript so much. I mean, there's a lot of similarity. And I was the opposite because I was in on, see, I already had a build step when CoffeeScript came around. And you know you know how I like build steps, Cable. CoffeeScript lost me without at the lack of a ternary. Oh, you're a ternary guy? Wow. Wow. You lost me, Cable, when uh, you no, just no, said no, that. I, so <laughs> coming back to ES Toolkit, uh, I think there's actually something interesting here uh, from a branding perspective, right? So they say built-in... TypeScript types. The whole thing is built in TypeScript. Why is this not TS Toolkit? Ooh. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to posit it so that Jared would use it and shout it out on changelog. Oh, that would be like metagame. That would be super smart. Nick, what do you think? Uh, the same reason that it's not a TS Lint anymore. It supports all ECMAScript variants. I see. So they're trying Meaning to JavaScript and TypeScript, not probably not uh, ActionScript or anything like that, or CoffeeScript, most likely. But don't don't all TypeScript like it all compiles down to JavaScript, so it all supports all forms of ECMAScript. Yeah, I I don't know. I thought I already thought that Lodash was highly tree shakeable, so I I don't know. I haven't used Lodash in probably since the Backbone days, since the underscore days. How do you get your group eye on, Nick? How do you get your group eye on? Is that in TypeScript? No, but and you're not going to like this answer, but I just <laughs> write my own. <laughs> oh, I actually don't. I don't mind that at all. Okay. I got no problem. I mean, if you have map and reduce, you can pretty much write all the other ones, exactly. which is what Lodash is. I yeah. mean, it's just a series of map reduces in order to provide nice wrapper functions that are more directly doing that thing that you know that they do, filtering, rejecting, blah, 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 grouping. I got no problem with you writing your own. Writing these two is is like the number one place to level up your your type game for TypeScript because now you're right. Now I don't like it as much because <laughs> <laughs> you're writing like these mapped types and conditional types that are all globbed together to to give you the exact output that you would expect, but only in type. How many lines of code is is the Nick Nisi group by? <laughs> it's probably like it's probably exactly what you said, like a map and a reduce, like a couple of lines of that, and then probably triple the lines for the type annotation. Exactly. <laughs> I'll never use that. It's Despicable. It's, it's amazing, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will just use the built-in group by. Thank you very much. Now that we have a ray grouping in JavaScript, which is what we're all here to party about. Um, there's also some more stuff that's smaller that I did not write down, but we will link up to Mary's entire Newstack article for people who want to get the full rundown because there's much more coming or that came in 24. And stay tuned, y'all, because Temporal is 2025. <laughs> you know, just right around the corner. Is there anything beyond Temporal and decorators that you're excited for that's been promised forever? Me? Type annotations. Yeah? I don't know, sort of. Not that I'll necessarily use them, but I'll be happy that they're there, you know, for people who need that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. If, if you gave me, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I'm also not looking at a list of like things coming down the pipeline. So if you could give me a few examples, I would say excited, not excited. There's one for me that I can think of off the top of my head that I've been wanting forever. And it, mm. it's not life changing or anything, but it would just be fun and it would be new and would solve the problem that it solves better than the way I currently do it. And that's the pipeline operator. Oh yeah. Oh yes, please. I like pipelines. I live in Elixir land on the server side and we use pipelines all the time and I would love to use them in the browser as well. Absolutely. Yeah. H heads up. I was curious. Why is ES, ES toolkit so much more tree shakeable or bundling down smaller? And it turns out that they are essentially flattening the logic out for a lot of their, Things. So like if you look at Lodash implementation of once as a thing, it uses once, it imports before and then uses the special case because once is a special case of before and it has that all over the place where it's like they're basically composing their functions out of their own functions, which is like right. the functionally pure way to do it. Like it makes sense. But ES Toolkit is implementing each one just flat so it doesn't have any dependencies so that if you import once, you don't import once and then before and then anything before you know, is doing, you're just importing once, which is this like, looks like 
18 line function. Yeah, that's actually pretty smart. I like that. Thanks for looking that up. That's interesting. They basically done what Nick did with group by only with all of them. And uh, there you go. Well, and that kind of makes sense if you're a utilities library yeah. author, right? Like you can take the time to do that extra work and it makes your library so much more uh, independently usable in that way. Right. I do wonder if you start using a larger amount of the functions in your code. If you like this is this is once again like the 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 classic like do you have a runtime ish thing that is shared or is everything flattened and independent? Like at what point is the crossover where it's actually more expensive because you're shipping a lot of duplicated logic. But I would bet, you know, most code bases, especially as we move into this like we split things, we only load what's necessary for each particular things, like they're going to benefit from that flattened approach. And there's plenty of environments that I've been in where it's just you have to play politics to get new dependencies in or, you know, we just don't want to ship new third party code in. And if it's like that, where it's just like, there's this standalone thing. I mean, at that point you can just copy and, and paste from it, which is fantastic. And it's also just way, way easier to learn from that. Like how is group by actually created? How would you do that? If you're like, Oh, it's calling this utility that's calling this utility and you have to go up this stack, then it like you lose the thread on that a little bit. So I literally remember doing that with Lodash years ago because I used it all the time. I appreciated it. And I just wanted to see, I think at one point I wanted just one function and I was like, I'm just going to copy paste that function into my code base. Cause I'm not above that. I will definitely do that when it seems like it's smarter. And I went, and I'm like, Oh, I can't actually do that. Cause I'm also going to need this other one. Right. And then I follow that one. I'm like, Oh, there's like a call stack here and they're calling all their own functions. And it's kind of hard as an outsider. It's kind of hard for me to reason about. I also ruined my plan of just copy pasting a single function, <laughs> um, but it did look really nice and thought through. And so I was impressed by the by the engineering. But ultimately, I think probably simple would have been would have served me better in that particular case. Yes, toolkit. There you go. Still written in TypeScript as is Lodash, as I discovered when I when yes. started digging into this. Because I think, as Nick highlighted, TypeScript may have won. It's won. It's won. What did it win? Tell us what it won, Nick. Our hearts and our minds. <laughs> <laughs> Creepy. Okay. Um, you say that now. When am I going to stop saying it? <laughs> Apparently when type annotation ship. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> well, then we can stop talking about TypeScript, right? We're like, hey, it's just, now it's won. I'll, I'll probably give up at that point. <laughs> so you know what? It won. You'll probably be retired. We probably all will be by the time that shifts. Probably. Well, probably before Temporal comes out, it sounds like. <laughs> Might be hanging them up, too. Okay. Uh, no no dissing on the Temporal, folks. We love the effort being put in. We're ready for it. We're here for it. K-Ball, State of React. Yeah. 2023. So 2023 survey, which was published mm, five days ago as of when we're recording it. Oh, so last year's survey is out now. Last year's survey is out as of July 20, 2024. Gotcha. Okay. What's interesting here? Interesting to me looking through was like looking at stuff like what are the pain points people are feeling? So there was sections on like main API pain points uh, where some of the biggest pain points I see are the forward ref memos and the context API. Uh, memoization, apparently, if you follow the rules, you can use React compiler now. You don't need to worry about it. So that's hopefully one pain point they're actually getting rid of, but uh, we'll see. They also have some new API pain points, lots of people complaining about React server components. Interestingly, number three on the, quote, new APIs pain points around React is Next.js issues. So it's more indication of the extent to which Next.js and, and React are becoming sort of entangled with one another. There is a place where you can sort of see what frameworks people are using. Um, and there, I think it was um, the one that's still the most known was create react app. It's not gone away, but lots of people don't like it anymore. They're pretty unhappy with it. After that was uh, next It is sort of the most, most people have tried it and it actually has reasonably positive sentiment. Like 46% of people said they liked it. 44% felt neutral about it and just under 10% ish uh, were unhappy if I'm reading that right. Actually, it's confusing to me because they have like multiple numbers on the same. <laughs> I'm having trouble with their graphs, but 
relatively large percent of people like it. A lot of people felt neutral, and then just a few people didn't like it. Gatsby's still on there. Nobody likes it. Astro and Remix are following up. And then Redwood is also in there, but also nobody likes it. <laughs> Let's see. Other things of interest. I mean, I noticed that Syntax is still more popular than we are, but we're coming in number two again. So, you know, that's, that's all good. Gosh. Syntax, man. We need to have a syntax flippening party. Like, how are we going to flip in those guys? You know? At least we're beating the change log. <laughs> <laughs> that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? If we couldn't beat them. <laughs> we're not even close, though. We're at uh, 7%, and syntax is at 16%. They've more than doubled our respondents. But this was last year. I mean, maybe we already flipped them, and we haven't even noticed. We don't even know yet. They're pretty good. Gotta say, like credit where credit's due. They're awesome. I I got no problem with those guys. I just like to, I like to complain, but I think they've, I think they've deserved all their success and I'm happy for them. I just want to deserve equal amounts and then maybe more than they have. (laughs) (laughs) Got to recruit them. Didn't they get like bought out or something too? Yes, they are wholly owned by Sentry now. What's amazing to me in that, in in just that podcast section is this is, this is only 28% of respondents. There's 72% that listed none for their podcast consumption. We got a big market to tap. I was going to say, that could be how we catch up as we go after the 70-something percent. All we got to do is uh, ask Sasha for the email addresses and bam. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. We would never do that. Unless you got the email addresses, let me know. Still kidding. Anything else, K-Ball? Those were the things that stood out to me. Let's see. I don't know, Nick or Jared, did either of you get a chance to look through anything else that stood out to you? I was just happy to see some of my picks actually show up on the list of things. Like, like for example, X-State mm-hmm. has about 10% usage with most of it being favorable, it looks like. But it, you know, it made it on the list. That's pretty cool. And then I do think it's interesting just the the whole, I don't know if controversy is the right word, but the world around React and Next and how, it, I don't know. It doesn't seem like there's positive news out of that relationship. I would tend to agree. Negative sentiment would be what my analysis is. If you fed me all of the public talk and asked me to have my neural network determine if it's positive or negative sentiment, I would say negative sentiment. This is interesting. So at the end, Josh Como, who I think has been on the show before, definitely has been on the changelog, uh, the third best React podcast out there, has a conclusion that he wrote at the end of this. So I think probably Sasha asked him to write this, and this is interesting. He says that he thinks that this year has been the most interesting year, uh, the biggest year for React since 2018 when React hooks were first introduced. He goes on, and at the end... Um, he's talking about React server components, and he says, if I had to guess, I'd say that in 2028, there will be two Reacts in wide circulation with roughly equivalent usage. The full stack version, quotes on full stack, with server components and server actions, and the client-only single-page app version. I wonder your guys' reaction to that particular prediction from Josh Como. So it's interesting that that he would say that, and it makes me wonder... Like, would those both be called React? Or is what happens, React continues down this full stack direction, which they've very much been going, and some other competitor says, I mean, this is the dynamics we're talking about before. They're incorporating more and more and more into React core, and at some point, it's enough that the complexity starts to really bother people, which if you look at the pain points, like excessive complexity was like the top React pain point when in the question at the end that's are there any other react pain points you'd like to mention and they say excessive complexity that's the incorporation of all of these different pieces coming in and at some point there's room for a simple take of a competitor to actually rise up and eat up a bunch of those and i think that might become that second react quote unquote except maybe it's not called react maybe it's called view or quick or Astro. Astro is weird because they actually do something different. But like maybe it's one of these competitive frameworks that says, you know what, we don't need all that complexity. We'll handle one use case, which is client side applications, and we will do it really well. Yeah. Maybe maybe one would be from the before times before they started going into this. So it'd be the the pre times. They could call it something like preact or something. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that 
Dojo Revival. <laughs> I was going to say Backbone. <laughs> Backbone 3.0. Do you think that server-side rendering is a fad and will just eventually revert back to spas? So I remember when I was first looking at the, the tech industry back in early 2000s, and I did an internship at Sun Microsystems, and they had this thing where they were experimenting with thin clients because they had all their stuff on the server, and that was a new... Uh, and maybe they were going back because they had before they'd had these fat clients. Like we've been in this like server client, server client, what happens in the server? What happens in the client? Like that cycle has happened four times now across the industry. Going back pre web, pre like back to like all these different things. So will we have that cycle again? I mean, if past performance is the best predictor of future performance performance, I would say, yes, we'll see that again. Have we gotten to the other side of the pendulum yet? Like, we, I, I think we're still swinging away. I think we have to get to a point and then we swing back. And it doesn't. I feel like we're swinging away at this point from from SPAs. From I think that's true. I think right now we are we are swinging towards doing a lot more on the server again. Yeah, but there's a lot of friction in that path right now that's slowing that or reversing that. Like I'm. I was heavily looking it into with react in particular, I guess maybe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was looking heavily into to next and all of the, the friction that I ran into. I, I was just like, you know, a spa, I, I know I can ship a spa. So let's do that. How'd it go? Then I, I woke up and <laughs> had to go to real work. <laughs> you didn't actually <laughs> ship anything. <laughs> Sounds about right. Checks out, but you should see the types in that sucker. He's got oh, beautiful so types. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want to jump into a different tangent. Uh, sure. It, what's one word that comes to mind with React? Like, if if you think of what type of library or framework React is, what what's the first word that comes to mind? When you say what type of framework, I go back to it's a view library. Okay. Yeah. That's two words. Yeah. View. <laughs> yeah. I'd say client with an I E, not the U E. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I think I. You're you're in the same ballpark. I was going to say a component library, right? Like it's, okay, it's component, components, yeah, sure. views. You're you're creating UIs for it, and there is a component pain points section of this. So that's effectively what the whole thing is. And if you take the top what four things that are listed there, which accounts for fifty one percent of the problems, the the top pain points, it's all about CSS. And so CSS is definitely like a big problem. Not just in React, but in all component frameworks, I think, at this point. And I wonder what the solution for that is. If you asked me, and I hadn't seen this, I would say Tailwind. But Tailwind is listed as number two with Tailwind issues. And I don't see how Tailwind's an issue. But Mm. do note that only 3% of the survey respondents replied to this question. Oh, I didn't didn't click on it. You may be over-indexing on that. But interesting point. I just feel like we found either our pull quote or our title for the episode. CSS is a big problem. Like Nick Nisi. Like that's just, that's the quote. <laughs> uh, and then like in parentheses, and I hate it, you know, something like that. I'm, I'm fine no. with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting thought. There's another angle into all of this. Like what does the application system of the future look like is maybe we're going to have all of our UIs be generated. Has it, have you all played with websim.ai at all? No. Oh, so much fun. Go to websim.ai. It creates, it gives you this little fake browser with what you put in a URL that you think should exist in the world, and it will generate it for you on the fly. You can pass in parameters, you know, query, query params, like your URL params, and it will tune it. Uh, you can actually use that to point it to external resources. So I saw a guy who set up a little like WebSocket server and then created a WebSim page that referenced that in a param that was a chat. And you could actually get multiplayer on this because through his like external resource he set up. It's banana pants. And like it's literally just a big prompt sent over to Claude Opus that says, dream with me, create a website based on this. And it will. And that's an extreme version, but I do think there's a world in which you have stuff like 
you've got a component library, maybe it's MUI, maybe it's something like this, and your backend is an LLM of some sort that references some coded tool calls, but that's a weaving it all together and it says, pick which elements are useful to display this and throw them on the screen. And is that a thin client? I think it's a thin client. I think that's like stuff's happening on the server, but maybe it's streaming out that HTML and CSS from the, the server. That's what WebSim is doing. It's like streaming that stuff straight from the LLM. And it seems to pretty much work. It's not reliable. It's a toy. But like, is that the way we're going? I don't know. Well, I think unreliable and toys are definitely the way that we're going right now. <laughs> <laughs> An appropriate conclusion to a TypeScript episode. Yes. Yeah, I, I wasn't sold until until it did generate a TypeScript fan page by Jared Santo from the changelog about why he loves TypeScript. So yeah, I, I can see the appeal of this. Send me a link. Can I? <laughs> you can. Yeah, you can you <laughs> can know. share you can share the outer link and it'll get Send I a link, we'll put that. it in the show notes. Oh nice. So this is like uh this is like a JS party equivalent of a deep fake, Nick. I mean, this is like you are f- trying to fool people into thinking not well of me. Okay. I was just I was just I was just stalling so I could get the link. That is amazing. Let's see it. TypeScript fan page from Dredge. <laughs> Why I love TypeScript. As a developer and podcaster, I've come to appreciate the power and flexibility of TypeScript. It's actually this is actually super boring. <laughs> I think it should be way fancier for they don't know my they don't know my style, man. I got way more style. You gotta that. pass in some params. You know, style equals epic poem or something like that. Yeah. Tell them it has to rhyme to the beat of Snoop Dogg's Lottie Dottie. <laughs> now that's my style. Yeah, put right. that in as an inspiration parameter. See what it does. <laughs> okay, now we're just live prompting on the air. We should call it a show. I think we've devolved far enough for this episode. We ha- we hit our obligatory AI chapter. We got it in. So that means we can officially stop. Uh, all the links to all the things will be in your show notes. Assuming Nick can get this prompt written in time. I've destroyed <laughs> Nick's productivity for the rest of the day. The TypeScript finizzle. <laughs> <That>. <laughs> Brought to you by Jay to the Rod from the changelog. Okay. It's getting a little better. We're getting a little better. See, it needs more humanity. I, you inject some more humanity into it, things start to get more interesting. That's what I found. Put that in as a parameter, right? Humanity level 500. Oh, that was a little lots of better design. Tune into the changelog. It's just, now it's just. Now it's just talking jive, you know. This is just like stereotypes on stereotypes on stereotypes. All right, let's call it a show. Anything else? Anything we didn't talk about? Anything you guys want to say before we call it a day? And yes, that did rhyme on purpose. Silence from the peanut gallery. Go ahead, Nick. Nope, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> why do I? Why do I put up with you sometimes? <laughs> he leans in. He opens his mouth, and then he says, "No." That's it. I had I had come up with my own list of things, of topics, of newsworthy things, and oh, you did. I don't want to. I don't want to jump into another tangent because we have to. We have to go. But we got four minutes before Cable has to hop off. <laughs> is there is there anything good, or is it just going to be like Nick level good? Nick level good. I mean, this was an emergency podcast, right? So <laughs> this like... was a Nick level emergency. <laughs> so I mean, what, what can we expect? There, there's a there's a title for you. Yes, that's a good title. All right, Nick, I'll let you read one headline that you want to discuss, and then Cable and I will decide whether or not we're going to let you talk about it. I can't remember the name of it, but there's a new feature in Astro that that lets you more natively support Tailwind by effectively baking in the CLSX utility right into it. I fell asleep in that <laughs> sentence. Cable, did you follow that? So it's another example of pulling in a third-party dependency into a core of something as a yes. build. Yes. This, that's a pattern that we're seeing here. So there, there's got to be more of these. Hashtag and, no build step. And Astro just, it didn't seem to get a lot of love in that uh, that survey either. Not that it didn't, got like hate, but it just didn't seem to register very high. On behalf of Nick Nisi <laughs> <laughs> and K-Ball, I'm Jared. This is JS Party. We've officially run out of things as Nick <laughs> talks to the air. We'll talk to you all on the next one. That is JS Party for this week. You've officially survived this Nick level emergency pod. If you dig it, share the show with a friend or three. 
If you didn't dig it, we will happily refund zero dollars into your bank account. Was that overly snarky? I'm just messing around. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you spending some of it with us. Thanks again to our partners who help us bring you JS Party for free 99. Fly.io, Breakmaster Cylinder, and Sentry. Use code changelog to save yourself a hundred bucks and give us credit for pointing people towards our partners at Sentry. Next up on the pod, Minecraft. Yes, that Minecraft. Did you know the scriptability of Minecraft is largely driven by JavaScript behind the scenes? Come back next week to hear all about it. Until then, keep your JavaScript tight and your TypeScript out of my face. Thank you very much. Cheers, y'all. Till next time.